Uh, but we'll go ahead and get started. So foundation plantings from the mulch up. This is a new one for me. So I've kind of combined a few different things, uh, focusing really a little bit on the design aspect, but then also some plantings that you can do to make your front yard a little bit more appealing or adding some things um, if you want to jazz it up. So I do have to start things off by telling you that CSU is a equal opportunity university. If there's anything we can do to make this presentation or anything more accommodating, please let me know. I have turned on the transcripts. If you don't like to see them on your screen, you can actually disable them in your own settings. Um, but just let us know if there's anything that we can do to make this more comfortable for you. And if you're not familiar with Extension, we are, I like to say we're pretty awesome. Um, I learned about Extension when I was a sophomore at Iowa State University. And Extension is this incredible outreach arm of the university. Uh, CSU is our land grant institution and Extension is affiliated with our land grants. And so what that means is that we take all of that amazing research that's happening at the university it's closed today, so maybe not much research is going on, uh, but then we share it with people in the community. So I get to specialize in the area of horticulture. I work with master gardeners. I work with the green industry and HOAs. And then I get to bring all of that incredible research that's happening back to a place that you can use in your everyday life. So if you've moved here from a different part of the country, I'm from Minnesota, Baking at altitude is a very different beast. And so learning those tips and tricks, that's where Extension can help you. So reach out to us and we do have some great resources that you could consider too. So we have our main Extension website. It just got overhauled. So if you've ever visited our Extension website in the last few months, you have noticed how sluggishly slow it is. Happy to report, we just got an email that it's a little bit faster. So that's good news. Uh, Plant Talk Colorado, our shorter gardening scripts, just a couple of paragraphs of information. We also have about 300 of those translated into Spanish. And so if you're working with a Spanish speaking individual, we have some gardening information available for them. And then we have the Colorado Master Gardener website, which includes, yes, even more information and lots of other interesting things as well. Um, we do have the cohorts blog, and what I'll do is I'll kind of compile all of this, send it to Kim, who can then forward it to you so that you can peruse those at your own leisure, because there's a lot, lot to cover. So today what we're going to cover as you snuggle in and watch the snow outside is we'll just talk a little bit about the basics of landscape design so that you have some ideas of how to approach kind of not maybe starting, not necessarily starting new, a lot of us don't have that opportunity, but maybe looking to refresh or enhance areas that you have. Uh, we'll talk briefly about the culture and care and just some general landscaping uh, FYIs for you. And then we'll actually go into plant selection. So we'll, that's what we're going to cover. And again, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat, you can unmute yourself and ask me, and there will be time at the end as well before you do uh, your business meeting. So the basics of landscape design, I had one class in landscape design, so I am by no means an expert in this subject, uh, but essentially what you want to do is landscape design is a process. It's something that you should think about, and I think as gardeners, we all get really excited. Kim was just saying how she got her seeds in the mail yesterday, and we are easily wooed by everything, right? We see something, we go to the garden center, we look at a seed catalog and we have to have it. Not necessarily thinking about how we can put it into our landscape, if it's going to fit, if it's the right plant for that area, all of those things. So design really is that process that you want to think about. And design should really have a purpose as well. So thinking about maybe more the front side of your landscape, the front of your home, we should look for things that can frame your house, so kind of softening some of those corners, but also helps with a flow. So you probably, you might have a sidewalk. Um, maybe you have like a small stepping stone area. Maybe you have a small patio on the front of your home. Uh, all of those things should be taken into consideration. And then you'll want to kind of locate the elements and the elements can be the plants, the benches, the pottery, all of those things to really create a space that is aesthetically pleasing. 
And here's the thing with design. It is yours. It is something that you should love, that you should be passionate about. Just because your neighbors might have all cool color plants, the purples and the blues, you can use bright colors if that's what you're passionate about. Um, so design is also very personal, or personal, and it should be related to how you're using the space. The basics, what you also want to think about, there's a lot that goes into design, is that there's some principles that you'll kind of adhere to. So order, unity, repetition. So in this case, we have a very long line of Carl Forrester grass, not bashing Carl Forrester in the appropriate place. He is absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Uh, but you can see how that repetition. So if you've been to Centera over on the east side of the interstate, you'll notice how they use a lot of blue stem and things to provide that repetition. You also want to think about scale and proportion. The elements of design are where things get a little bit more specific and a little bit more where you can pick things. The line, our line of Carl Foresters, that is one of the elements. The form, the texture, the sound, the color, the smell, and this is probably the things that we get most excited about. So things that bring us back to childhood, like lilacs wafting through the windows, or um, a color of a red rose that might remind you of your favorite red rose that you had. Um, all of those things, plus sound is so important. So a lot of people plant aspens, not a tree I would recommend here in the, the lower elevation front range, but people plant it because they like kind of that click clack of the leaves um, as the wind blows through. So sound is a really important aspect of landscapes that should also be considered. When we also think about design, scale and proportion is key, right? We've all seen the blue spruce that has eaten the house. We've all seen it. This plant that got too big and then there's radical pruning that takes place or maybe something that's planted too close to the sidewalk. And then there has to be interesting pruning to create a cutout uh, so that people can pass by. Um, all of those things are really important. And when you're thinking about the front of your house, you do want to consider the height of your house as one of the things that you'll use for scale and proportion. A two-story house, you're going to need a little bit taller plants because you have more house. Uh, something that's one level, or a ranch style house, you can get away with plants that are probably less in height. And of course, here's the thing that when we put plants in, we know they're going to grow. So things might look a little disproportional in the beginning, but know that as things grow, we're always planting for mature height. And that's, I think, sometimes where we get in trouble because as gardeners, again, we get super excited and cram everything together. And five years down the road, we're regretting every decision because now we either have to move things, we have to divide things, or we might have to take things out, which is the worst part. Um, you can also scale it to the size of a normal human being. So someone who's maybe five foot 10, six feet tall, something like that, uh, that's another thing. And that's more for some of the hardscaping, maybe pergolas, decks, and things like that. So plants and then the hardscaping, two different things that you'll want to scale appropriately. When we think about plants, their form is also really important. And so you can look at a landscape and you can have lots of different textures, but you also want to have different forms. So looking at plants that are maybe more columnar, a lot of our junipers, we talk about junipers, are more narrow. And as we have houses that tend to have smaller lots, some of those columnar plants are going to be really, really helpful, especially if you want some greenery, um, but you don't have a lot of space. Um, plants that are perfectly pyramidal. I'm very type A, and so I love things that are exactly the same shape. Um, so a little leaf linden is, tends to be perfectly pyramidal, or some of our spruce and some of our evergreen trees. Round is a great form, so crab apples tend to be more round. Um, and then weeping. I think weeping has a really interesting characteristic. I think it's unique. Uh, it may not be for every landscape. I personally don't have any sort of weeping forms of plants, uh, but it, it can be something that could be incorporated. And I have a couple pictures later of weeping forms for you. You'll also want to think about texture. So texture is the plants and their their structures. What do their leaves look like? So you're going to take color out of the picture and really just look at the overall texture of the plant. Is it more spiky? 
in the case of iris? Or is it, you know, a little bit wider leaf in the case of this banana plant, which of course isn't hardy, but I just really like the texture of it. Then you can look at the different flowers, you can look at the different leaves and all of those things. Plus, if you have a front lawn, the lawn is going to provide texture too. If you mow your lawn often and you love a perfectly manicured lawn, that's going to be different than if you have a buffalo grass lawn that maybe you mow once a year or never. It's going to be a little bit more natural looking. Um, so texture is really good. And one thing I learned, I love this trick, and we can all do this with cell phones or pretty easily if you have um, a computer where you can do this, but take, oops, take a picture. I took it out. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, take a picture <laughs> of your landscape and then put it in black and white. And then look at that. So in this case, the one on the right, if we looked at that in black and white, what would stand out? Probably the banana plant, maybe this cool spiky thing. And this is obviously not Colorado, but all of those are going to have different textures. And that's how you know you're kind of hitting that mark with textures. Just flip the picture to black and white or set your phone to take a picture in black and white and then look at it and see if it's interesting. If it's not interesting, then maybe you could add some different plant materials to make it look a little bit more appealing. Color is huge. So we all have our favorite colors. We all have passions for colors. Some of us are more attracted to the cool season or the cool colors than the warm colors. And you may have parts of your garden that you'll design based on how you use them. So in the morning, you might have more of the warm colors to kind of wake you up while you have your cup of coffee. And then in the evening, as you maybe enjoy a cocktail or a beverage, you might have more of the cool colors to kind of bring your resting heart rate down and kind of just enjoy it. Um, colors like black, there are some black flowers, believe it or not, there's a petunia that's amazing. Black, white, and green are mostly considered to be neutral. So you can use those as accent colors in your landscape. But go back to your days of the color wheel. You can look at those primary colors, the tertiary colors, um, the complementary, the analogous, and then you can kind of put things together. But again, I said that landscape design is really specific to you. If you love matching red with purple, match red with purple. There's nothing wrong with that. If you like it, then you should go with it. But maybe you're more, you're not as risky. And so you want more of the, the blending of the purples and the blues and maybe some green. Uh, but color is a really important thing. And I noticed that when I started planting my landscape in Windsor, everything I picked was yellow. I loved yellow, I still love yellow. Um, yellow is one, so if you have any vision problems, yellow is the color that you tend to see the most in the landscape. So it's a very bright color, and it's generally noticed by those who may have vision problems. Um, so I noticed that I had a lot of yellow, so I started buying plants that were not yellow purposely um, to mix them. And I really consider my garden to be more cottagey, there's not a certain theme. There's not a certain color. Um, it's really what I like and kind of, you know, a lot of things like Bob Ross said, they're really happy accidents. <laughs> so, um, it's just kind of putting things together and seeing how it works. And smell is so important. So if it's a front landscape or a place that you frequent a lot, a patio, uh, maybe you have a couch in, by your front window, the smell is going to be really important. So having lilacs, I have lilacs planted in the front of my house and when they're in bloom, they waft through the front window and it just brings me back to childhood. My mom had a huge lilac on the side of her house that I just loved. Uh, roses, as we know, some have smell, some don't. Uh, so if you want fragrant roses, that's where you can do a little bit more research. In order to get roses that are hardy, that are disease resistant, that bloom well, that scent smell actually kind of was lost in some of the genetic breeding, um, but there are still a lot of roses that smell good. And then on the left, I put Korean spice viburnum. I'll talk about Korean spice again, but it is wonderful. It's kind of a sharp, um, spicy smell. Oh, the flowers are amazing. And then the leaves are a little bit textured, a little bit like sandpaper. It's kind of a semi evergreen but a really wonderful smell. So consider that too. So that smell, the texture, the colors, the proportion, there's a lot that goes into landscape design. So how do you apply all of this with your foundation plantings? And what does this really look like? 
Um, so here we have some more landscapes. We have uh, Black Eyed Susan, there's Carl Forrester again. We have a, or a maiden grass. Um, and I will talk about grasses because I think grasses are an unsung hero of our landscapes. Um, grasses are really universal. They're incredibly drought tolerant and they have a lot of ornamental appeal. Their flowers are interesting. They have great structure. Um, I was just out shoveling before this talk and I have a maiden grass kind of on the corner of my yard and she was still standing proud and tall even with all this heavy wet snow. So that is a good thing to consider. Um, but how do you apply these um, with our planting? So the first thing to do really is a site analysis, and it doesn't have to be complicated. You can just sketch out your house in general things about your landscape. Um, if you have a new landscape, this is a great thing to do. But even if you have an existing landscape that maybe you're looking to renovate or enhance in some way. Um, so I really like this. So maybe you have some overgrown junipers that have just you know, <laughs> done their time. You don't want them anymore. They don't look good. Um, you can actually make a note to remove those. Um, if you have a great view from the house. Maybe you can see horse tooth from your house. I don't know, that would be pretty awesome. I have houses all around me, so I don't have a great view. Um, maybe you don't, you know, you'll budget to put in a bigger patio or you want to put in a lanai or something like that. Um, these are all things, or maybe you're looking to actually reduce your turf areas and you want to expand vegetable garden or expand your perennial garden. These are all things that you can do now during these snowy days to kind of plan for the future. And here's the thing too, is I'm not a very patient person. I like things done now, but doing this <laughs> over time will be to your benefit. Uh, so making sure that you just take the time and it's always good to live in a house for at least a year to kind of get an idea of what the seasons are like. What's the sun exposure? How hot does it get on your west facing landscape? Um, do you need a tree planted? And then you can add that. Uh, these are all things that you can consider. So your exposure, the water needs, that's going to be at the forefront of everybody uh, going forward is how do we use water efficiently, but still have landscapes that are pleasing and aesthetically um, soothing to us. And I will say landscaping can increase the value of your home by about 20%. Um, so don't rockscape, you can still have plants, we just need to do it in a more sustainable way. And Gertrude Jekyll, who is a very famous um, English designer, she said this decades ago, right plant, right place. I'm sure you've seen this, I'm sure you've heard it a little bit of an extension mantra. Uh, we said it probably a thousand times during Master Gardener training. Erica can attest to this, uh, but right plant, right place. That is so key for everything, really being cognizant and thinking about where your plants can go and where they'll thrive. And thank you, and I will get, I will try to talk a little bit about natives, but thank you, Erica, for being Johnny on the spot and providing her with some resources too. Also with your plants, think about year round interest. Today is a great day, uh, once the snow clears, to look at your garden. Is it just a little bland? Is there something that you could do to enhance it? Um, but year round interest is important and it goes back to those key functions of form, texture, color, smell, and sound. So again, ornamental grasses, they do have fall color, which is really nice. Again, an unsung hero of the landscape, uh, but ornamental grasses can be a great way to add three season, potentially four season interest uh, in your garden. So here's just a house, kind of like everybody's house today. You know, what does it look like? Um, are there some ways that maybe you could enhance things? Are there gaps? Um, in this case, you know, we have some great foundation plantings by the house. I like that. Out here, it gets a little thin. I'm not sure what's under here, probably some turf. That would be my guess. But are there things that we could add, like maybe some cone flower? You know, the little caps of the cone flowers catch the snow and they're so cute. Plus they feed the birds during the winter. Really important thing. Uh, but this is a good thing to do is kind of take inventory of your landscape all season, take pictures, and then take the time to assess them to see where you might enhance or um, where you might need to kind of 
work plans out of that area. Uh, there are different ways to do that. But year round interest is a good thing, especially since our winters can be longish in Colorado. Uh, my dad's in north of the cities in Minnesota and his winters are much longer than ours. So be grateful that we do have sunny days here. Then also consider the scale and proportion. So if you're in a townhouse, if you have a smaller home, the scale and proportion is huge. This goes back where you don't want a blue spruce that's going to eat your house. So you are going to scale things back to the size of the home that you have and also the relative yard area. Landscaping on an acre is very different than landscaping on you know, a, a 6,000 square foot lot. Uh, very, very different. So your plant choices will become uh, very, very specific because things can get big too quickly and then they can be an issue. So again, right plant, right place, looking at the mature size of the plant and making sure that you're not planting a problem. Uh, this is just another one of color and texture. Roses um, are surprisingly drought tolerant. So I think you could add some shrub roses to your landscapes. Uh, great color, the climbing roses do really well. Um, and in this case, we have some ladies mantle, love ladies mantle. It's a shade tolerant plant, very uh, dry shade tolerant as well, but can tolerate sun. Uh, we have some little miniature uh, pines, mugo pines or little spruces in there. Um, this looks like something that's not blooming. We have some salvia, um, some yarrow back here. So there's a lot of things and you're getting your textures, your colors. And what I also love about this is that they have a container of some annuals. So annuals totally have a place in Colorado gardens. Uh, this is where you would make sure that you're providing enough water for these plants. Um, but there are some more drought tolerant annuals too that you can consider. And the big thing is remember plants grow. Um, again, we've seen plants that have <laughs> overextended their boundaries. Um, this is English ivy on a house in somewhere in Europe. <laughs> Looks cool, but maybe not what you wanted. Um, this was probably a seedling or a sucker that was just never maintained. And obviously now we have some structural damage, uh, but plants grow and it could be something as simple as this, where this was planted in what seemed to be a really good location initially. The plant was small. We get a little one gallon or five gallon plant and we plop it in. And now because of right away, we have to either prune this in very creative ways. Uh, this does not bode well for this plant, um, but we've all seen this where we've had to uh, make sure that we have sidewalk or street clearance. And sometimes the cities will go through and actually clear cut um, if they need to. So generally on a sidewalk, you need eight foot clearance. Um, above your head. And then on a street, it tends to be a 15 foot clearance so that those trucks can get by. Uh, so just keep in mind of those things. Again, right plant, right place. Things are going to grow. It's not always going to look how it does for those first couple years uh, that you have it in the garden. Moving on to water. Um, I'm not going to talk about water too much, but hydrozoning is a term that you might uh, it would be best if you became familiar with it. And basically hydrozoning is grouping plants by their water need. So irrigation is done by an area, not an individual plant. Um, so in a vegetable garden, you're going to have routine water, water that you're going to provide um, multiple times a week because vegetables tend to be a higher water produced versus maybe the lawn. Maybe you're going to convert your lawn or try to uh, dry it down a little bit. That might be limited water or moderate water use. Um, so you're grouping plants together and this is where plant selection is really important. So buying plants that work well together that have similar water need and then placing them in a similar spot so that you can water them appropriately is going to be key. So you don't want to have cacti, which are a succulent and a low water plant, planted next to your tomato, which you're going to water multiple times a week. They're not going to get along because one's going to get overwatered, one's going to get underwatered. Uh, so again, hydrozoning is really important. And then adjusting the water for those plants. Initially, all plants are, are going to need routine water, whether they're xeric, whether they're native, 
whatever they are, they're going to need routine water for at least a few months, if not the first growing season. After that is when you make those adjustments of your water. So if you're buying more water-wise plants, uh, xeric plants, native plants, get them established. And then that's when you start to reduce their water needs. And this will save you water in the long run. That's really, really important. Drip irrigation in the landscape is really the way to go. Um, if you don't have irrigation in your landscape beds, that's totally fine. I don't have irrigation in my landscape beds. And so my yard is really a, if you make it, that's great. If not, I'll find something else that will. Um, but drip is going to be more pinpoint placement of irrigation as opposed to sprinklers, which of course waters an entire area. Drip is wonderful. So you can have your main line um, and you can use inline emitters, which just means the emitter is embedded within that plastic tube or you can actually run lines from the main line with spaghetti tubing and then have drippers at that point. However you want to set it up, it's great. It's not very hard to do. It seems really complicated and kind of scary, um, but this, you can see that this is a drip irrigation attached to a spigot on the house. So it is something that you could install. Um, but basically, if you kind of like doing Legos or Tinker Toys or putting kits together, it's a little bit fun. It uses a different part of your brain, um, but basically you can run those lines um, and then you will have um, just a couple of simple tools. You can have things that will punch holes into the line, um, but there's a couple simple tools that you can use to actually um, then set up your system. So every year for my vegetable garden, I grow different things. Vegetables are not my passion. I will readily admit that, um, but I like to grow different things. So I will actually <laughs> reconfigure the drip irrigation every year, depending on what I'm growing. Um, and I really enjoy it. And in general, your drip lines are going to be below any mulch that you use. And that has its pros and cons, but in general, it's going to be under there. Um, but the big thing is, is because again, your plants are small when they're first planted, and then they're going to grow, you need to adjust the drip accordingly. So for that first year, as things are getting established, you might water a little bit more and set your clocks accordingly, or you'll turn it on manually. And then as you grow, you might need to adjust things. And there could be a time, depending on the plants that you have, where you don't provide any drip irrigation. You just turn it off and let whatever the plants get naturally is how they're going to grow. Um, there are plants that can do that, very dry, plants or maybe you water in just extreme periods of drought. Um, that could be something too. So let's talk about landscape fabric. Um, I know that people use it. I know that it is recommended. I'm not a huge fan. That is my, <laughs> I'm just gonna tell you that right off the bat. Uh, there are two types of landscape fabric. So there's like a woven fabric that's more plasticky. And then there's this spun stuff uh, from polyester fibers. And it kind of is almost like a, looks almost like woolly. Um, and those are the type. So essentially you have your soil, your landscape fabric, um, probably your drip irrigation is under the fabric. So it might be soil, drip irrigation, landscape fabric, mulch on top. Um, that's generally what's done. And the reason I don't like landscape fabric is because it often looks like this. It's just a mess. This is black plastic. So this is a different type. This is sometimes used in vegetable gardens as well. But here's the thing is that all of these materials, they're supposed to be porous. They're supposed to allow water and oxygen to move through those layers of fabric. What happens is that dirt and other small things are going to clog those pores over time and oxygen and then water can't get through to where the plants and the plant roots are located. If you're using something like black plastic and you're using mulch on top of it, if you have any sort of slope, that mulch usually runs right off. And here's the thing, landscape fabric weed barrier usually doesn't prevent weeds from growing. If you really observe your garden and you have some landscape fabric, you'll probably notice that the weeds are growing on top. Um, you'll probably, you're probably not seeing a ton of weeds trying to come up from the bottom. And you're thinking, oh, that's because I have landscape fabric. Well, really weeds are smart. Mm -hmm. They will plant themselves where they have an opportunity to grow. And if they're below something, 
they generally can't germinate and there's generally not enough water to get them to germinate. So that's why they grow on top of things. So you'll see weeds growing on top of rock, on top of mulch. Um, and the other thing is, is that landscape fabric with our high UV radiation, it breaks down really quickly. So you'll start getting pieces or you'll start getting breaks in the landscape fabric. Um, so it might last a couple of years, three years, four, um, but then it will start to break down, especially if it's exposed to UV light. But because we're really trying to promote plant growth in this situation, it just is not a conducive environment for our plant roots to be successful. So again, plant roots need air, oxygen, and water in order to survive. The landscape fabrics usually block both of those things. So it doesn't allow for good moisture to get in to the soil itself, and it doesn't allow for good oxygen exchange as well. So one thing if you have landscape fabric is maybe consider lifting up a corner. You know, see if the soil underneath that landscape fabric is moist. If you have drip irrigation and then landscape fabric and then mulch, uh, it's hard to figure out if you have a break or if there's something leaking. Um, it just makes it really difficult. So my recommendation is skip the landscape fabric altogether and just put a thicker layer of mulch directly on top of the soil. And we'll talk about mulch next. Um, in terms of weed control for landscape fabric, depending on how the plant grows is really going to determine if it works or not. Um, so grasses, um, this is bluegrass right here. Grasses grow via rhizomes, which are underground runners. They might have stolons, which are above ground runners. Uh, Bermuda grass has both underground and below ground. Um, and so it just depends on how things grow. Thistle um, grows via rhizomes. And so one thistle is attached to the next thistle and the next thistle. Landscape fabric's not going to be able to control those kind of plants. Um, but weeds for the most part are going to blow in on top of the surface and that's where you're going to get uh, weed pressure. And it might reduce weed growth long-term, but I don't think it's a permanent solution for weeds. So that's where you have to look at your cultural practices and really decide uh, what you want to do. So Beth says, uh, her whole garden is covered in landscape fabric. She hates planting because of it. Sorry, Beth. Between all the rock and the fabric, uh, planting is just a chore. Any suggestions for removing it? So um, pretty drastic, but yes, you would have to scrape everything off the top and then remove it, being careful around your plants. Um, you can hire people who might have like a small dingo or something that actually can scrape it off. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a tough, tough thing. It takes hours of time, unfortunately. There's not a great solution, unless you can get some equipment and just scrape it off and know that you'll have some damage to your plants. Sorry, Beth. Okay, so should you use it? I would say there's better options. I think mulch, uh, wood mulch and other mulches are a better choice. Um, I would avoid for sure the plastic mulches. It's just not appropriate for landscapes. If you want to use it in your vegetable gardens, that's totally fine. You'll see in you know vegetable farms, they use black plastic to form hills and then they plant that way. It's a one season thing. So that's the other thing too, is that if you're using it in that manner, generally you're punching holes into it and you have to throw out the plastic. So you'll have to decide if it's a sustainable and economical way uh, to use resources. I don't love cardboard. I don't love newspaper. Um, those could be used in the vegetable garden where you're getting a little bit more water. In the landscape, I think they have limited application. Um, I think it'd be really hard. So I'm just thinking of trying to put down newspaper with the wind that we get and then trying to soak it in. It might work for you, um, but really I think just wood mulch um, is going to be the easiest thing. So what is best? Uh, a thick layer of wood mulch. And when we talk about a thick layer, you might have heard two to three inches. I would actually bump that up to four to five inches of mulch. That's going to be better. So if you've had issues with mulch blowing or moving or um, otherwise leaving your landscape, it's probably because the layer of mulch wasn't thick enough. So something thin <clears throat> is not going to do a lot of benefit. 
going to move more easily, but the thicker layer that you have, it's going to come back and pack down a little bit more. Um, and that's going to be uh, a better choice. If the area has been recently tilled or you've added organic matter, you could actually <laughs> bump that up to like six inches of mulch, which seems obscene and extreme. Um, but any disturbance of the soil is going to increase weeds. Have you ever noticed that every time you till, every time you um, disturb the soil, you have a fresh crop of weeds? And that's because the weed seed bank, which is just waiting for permit or the prime conditions, uh, is going to than Germany. The great thing about wood mulch is it's porous. It allows for great oxygen exchange and water can still get in to the soil and to the plant roots. Um, and there's been so many studies on the benefits of mulch. So it increases soil moisture, it reduces compaction, it adds organic matter, which is really important in our soils um, and just improves overall soil um, health, which is also nice. Not all mulches are created equal. Uh, the gorilla hair, gorilla hair is one that actually can mat down. And I have seen some hydrophobic, which just means like there's not good water exchange or not wa good water getting into the root system. So I've seen some hydrophobic conditions with gorilla hair and it's not very renewable. So they're actually taking that and shredding it from the um, barks of like redwood trees but they can't grow redwoods fast enough to keep up with the demand for gorilla hair. Uh, the other thing is, is that if you are up in the foothills or in areas that might be more fire prone, gorilla hair can actually be very flammable. So it's not a mulch I would necessarily recommend on the whole. Arborist wood chips are great. So if you're in Loveland, Fort Collins, uh, Windsor, they're chipping Christmas trees uh, probably as we speak. And then they let you as a homeowner or um, resident take those away. So you can take those free wood chips. Um, if you have an in with a, a tree care company, they might drop wood chips for you. So this is generally free. It generally also takes you doing the labor to get them to your house. Um, the chipping quality does matter. And with our Christmas trees, you might get bits and bobs of different trees. So it might not be as attractive, but in terms of plant health, the plant doesn't care. Uh, that's totally fine. Um, if you have a, an access to pine needles, they use this a lot in the South. So down in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, um, they actually use pine needles as mulch. They're great because they knit together. Um, if you have spruce trees or pine trees in your yard, let those needles fall and form a natural mulch at the base of your trees. It's going to be good for it. Um, they are very flammable too, so just be careful about using those. But there are lots of mulches out there. You can buy the dyed colored stuff. Those are wood or water-based dyes. They're not going to harm your plants. Um, you probably found out that the dye doesn't last forever, but maybe for a season. Um, but use a mulch that works for you. That's the biggest thing. Um, cost is big, maintenance, the size of the area, and you can consider using pea gravel or squeegee, which is just kind of a, a finer gravel. Um, it kind of compacts together a little bit more. It's generally used for paths. But if you're doing a lot of natives, um, if you're doing a lot of xeric or water-wise plants, pea gravel might be a good option, but still you are doing at least three to four inches thick of pea gravel in order to get that benefit. And just know that any sort of gravel or rock is not going to improve um, the soil itself, not the soil quality. Just a couple slides on pruning and then we'll get into plants and I'll pause before um, to see if anybody has any questions. Um, with pruning, big thing to always ask, this is the same for pruning your roses, pruning your trees, uh, pruning anything, what is the purpose of this plant. What do I want it to do? A um, couple of different pictures. So we have a hedgerow of, I believe, our viburnums, something, um, you know, more natural looking versus something that's really formal and maybe a little bit more maintained. But what is the purpose of the plant? Um, and timing of pruning is important for certain flowering shrubs. And so it is good to know when these shrubs bloom so that you know when to prune. So spring flowering shrubs, 
lilacs, forsythias, these are the ones that bloom right away in the spring. They are blooming on wood that was formed the previous summer. So if you make a habit of pruning everything in your landscape in May and June, and you have lilacs and forsythia, you're pruning off the flower buds. Oh, that's a bummer. So don't do that. So be aware of what you have and try to get things identified so that you know when to prune them. These shrubs, the spring flowering shrubs, are best pruned after they bloom. So after they have their bloom cycle, that is when you then would prune those. Versus our summer flowering shrubs, they are blooming on new wood. So wood that is formed during that season. So as we get into spring, plants like nine bark, Bloomis spirea, potentilla, they're going to be putting on new growth early on in the spring. And that is when they set their flower buds that will then bloom during the summer. So if you want to prune these plants in the spring, absolutely okay, because pruning generally stimulates new growth. New growth is going to have those flower blossoms on there, and then you can go ahead. So if you have a lilac, but it's never bloomed, it might be because you have timed the pruning of it wrong. And with pruning, um, I know that a lot of times shrubs are pruned um, to maintain kind of a ball shape or to fit in a space. We call this senseless shearing. Um, so I would say that shrubs don't necessarily need to be pruned just because uh, they should be allowed to grow into their natural shape and form. So pruning them into meatballs or little balls is just not necessarily how they want to grow. And it can actually result in really unhealthy shrubs. Um, it usually forms a lot of foliage on the outside of the plant, but nothing on the inside. Um, so just make those decisions. And if you like the look, that's totally fine. Uh, but just know for the overall health of the plant, maybe letting them grow to their natural shape. And if they have a wild branch, you know, accept that. That's okay. Or you could prune that one back. Um, I'll also talk about renewal pruning and then rejuvenation pruning. So renewal pruning is something that you can do to shape a shrub over three years. And so essentially you could take something that's really big and out of control and cut it back over a period of time in order to get it to be a little bit more um, friendly um, and not as unruly in the landscape. So what this does is it essentially suckers from the bottom. So the first year you're going to cut back a third of the oldest branches, the biggest, thickest branches on the shrub itself. You'll cut back a third of those. Next year, you're going to cut back the second third. And then the third year, you'll cut back the last third. What this does is it encourages the plant to sucker and regrow from the base. It also is going to reduce the overall plant height and again, can result in a nicer shrub. Now, if you have a shrub that's really old, really unwieldy, doesn't look great, it may not be successful. If you have a shrub that's in poor health, not putting on a ton of growth, the plant may not survive. So just be aware of that. But you could also put the flip side of what do I have to lose? Should I give it a try and see what happens? And if it doesn't work or it's not successful, then I can just plant something new. But renewal pruning can be used on lilacs, forsythia, um, you know, a lot of different shrubs, viburnums, um, and it will do really well. Rejuvenation pruning is when you cut everything back to the ground. Um, as close to the ground as you can get, and then the plant is going to sucker from the base. So this is a, a burning bush, a winged euonymus, and this is something that you can do. So this plant can get really big, it can get some dye back. Um, it's also known to sucker very well. So this is what you would do in early spring, sometime in February or March. You can do this with your lilacs, knowing obviously that you are going to cut off all of the flowers, or you can wait until summer and do this as well. Following this drastic pruning, make sure that you're watering well, add some mulch and encourage growth as best you can. Okay, are there any questions before I go into just a few plants? Anything? Okay. Um, I'll press on and if you do just throw them in the chat. So let's talk about a couple smaller trees that you could consider for your foundation plantings at the front of your house. 
The first is hot wings maple. You've probably heard of hot wings. It was one of our plant select introductions a number of years ago. And maples are kind of a strange tree in Colorado because some do really well, like the big tooth maple, um, Tatarian maple, and then some just do really bad, like the Freeman maple or the autumn blaze. Um, really does depend on the parentage and kind of the genetics of the plant. But hot wings, was selected because it has these incredibly bright cherry red Samaras, the fruit, the helicopter wingy dingies. Um, it's a great tree. It's smaller, gets to be about 20 feet tall. It can be sold as a single stem or a clump, uh, which you can see here, um, but just a really nice one kind of for a front corner of your house or for a smaller landscape, which is great. The next one is service berry. This is Ameline here. Uh, we do have native service berries to Colorado, so those are ones that you can consider uh, if you're looking for a native species. And then there are some nice introductions as well. So Autumn Brilliance uh, is one cultivar that you might consider, and it was selected, obviously, for its amazing fall color. Uh, service berry, I can't say enough good things about it. I absolutely love this tree. Could be considered a small shrub. Uh, it can be also a single stem or a clump form, but it definitely is a three season plant. So it has beautiful white flowers in the spring and it blooms somewhere around June. Those flowers develop into actually edible fruits um, that taste a little bit like a blueberry, uh, which is good because we can't grow blueberries here in Colorado, but this is a really nice edible fruit. Now I'm guessing you're not going to get to it before the birds so just be aware of that. But if you do get a taste or a sample, um, just know that it is a really nice flavor and it's kind of a blue colored fruit as well. And then going into the fall, the service berries all have really nice, beautiful fall color. Again, Autumn Brilliance was selected because it has a little bit better fall color, more of the orangey reds. Um, some of the others are a little bit more um, variegated in their color, but service berry, awesome tree, drought tolerant, um, really a nice species for our landscapes. A couple of evergreens. There are some weeping forms. So this is where you can get a little bit creative. Uh, just know that if you do buy a weeping tree, it is going to be expensive. They take a while to produce in the nursery. Um, they take a while to grow. Some of them need a little bit extensive pruning and propagation, um, but they can add a lot. And I just, I just, this guy looks like he's bending over like looking at something. Uh, so this is the blues, a weeping blue spruce. So as we know, blue spruce is our state tree. Uh, this would be a good one. Um, they tend to be a little bit more slow growing. So that is nice. And then there is a weeping white spruce that was introduced by Plant Select, which is a plant introduction program with CSU and the Denver Botanic Gardens and the green industries. So these are plants that are trialed and tested for Colorado, so weeping white spruce could also be an option. And you can see how it's very petite, very columnar, um, doesn't get unruly like some other evergreens we might run into. And then also junipers. Um, mm -hmm. Junipers get a bad reputation. I'm not, I've, I've said my fair share of things negative about junipers, uh, but these junipers are actually quite nice. So. There are more columnar types. If you're looking for something maybe to plant along a fence or for even just a little bit of screening, Woodward is a nice one. A plant select plant gets to be about 15 to 20 feet tall, but only about five feet wide. Really nice. Uh, Skyrocket is another really columnar form. Uh, blue chip has a beautiful blue color and is one that spreads horizontally. So junipers are awesome. It's just that what we do to them, we shear them, we prune them, we plant them in spaces where they don't fit. Then they get you know, mowed over by the lawnmower and they look bad. But again, right plant, right place. If we are selecting the right plant to fit in a space, um, they can be absolutely beautiful. So juniper should be on the list. Moving into a couple shrubs, viburnums. Um, I think an unsung hero of the landscape, viburnums are incredible, so many different kinds. The one that I would caution you against using is cranberry bush viburnum. 
Um, it gets aerified mites and it gets some other issues. It's just, it's not as reliable as some of these others. So double file is beautiful, more of an evergreen. Here's our friend Korean Spice, um, has some fun names like Baby Spice and Double Spice, I think is one. But again, really fragrant, kind of that beautiful, kind of scenty, spicy smell um, when it flowers. And then Nanny Berry is actually a really big one. It can be eight to 12 feet tall, nice for a corner of the house. All of the viburnums are reliable bloomers. They tend to have kind of pink or white flowers. Um, many of them are semi evergreen and they might have more of a textured leaf, kind of a sandpapery like leaf, um, but also very drought tolerant, not a lot of disease issues. So give viburnums a try. Just look at the mature height and width before you purchase. Nine barks are having a moment. Uh, there's so many cool nine barks out on the market. So here's just a few summer wine. Um, you can see that their leaf color um, is different in a lot of cases. So this one's more of a chocolate brown. This is more of a red. Darts gold is kind of a fluorescent yellow. It has a pink flower, which I don't love, but I do love the fluorescent green of the foliage itself. Um, nine bark again come in many different heights. So anywhere from maybe four feet tall up to 10 feet tall. Um, all will have reliable flowers and another great drought tolerant plant for our landscape. Lilac is a great one, obviously. Mentioned lilac a couple of times. Um, there are so many different cultivars and there are some Chinese strains. There are some um, more of the common type strains, the vulgaris, and just pick one again that, that fits your needs. So Miss Kim is, she's a classic. She's been around a really long time. Gets to be about five to six feet tall. Uh, what I've noticed about Miss Kim is she tends to bloom a little bit later than some of the other lilacs. So you could actually have a few different species in your landscape and then have a series of blooms um, if you really love lilacs and who doesn't, they're amazing. Um, really drought tolerant, you see them planted a lot around homestead areas <clears throat> um, just because they, they were planted very early on and then they have survived. So um, a great plant for Colorado. Apache plume is a native. So this is one of your natives. Um, I don't, <laughs> this, I struggle with this one because I love, uh, here's the flower and I love the seed head. So the seed heads are kind of like anemones. They look really pretty. Mm -hmm. The shrub itself without the seed heads or flowers is not the most attractive, but I can respect it. I will respect it. This is one that gets to maybe five to six feet tall and wide, um, tough as nails. Like this is one that will grow in the worst conditions with very little water and still do well. Um, the seed heads do persist through the fall. So that's really great. Um, but Apache plume is one that I think it's a love it or hate it. It's a little bit like cilantro. You can make your choice, um, but it is a nice native that you could add. And smoke bush is one, again, that I think we could plant more of. Um, I have a smoke bush. It never gets any water and it is fantastic. For the first few years, it did die back almost to the ground. But since then, once it got established, it is fantastic. And it is named smoke bush because of these incredible flowers that are like poofs of smoke on top of the plant. Uh, there are a green leaf form and then there's this kind of purpley burgundy form, royal purple. Um, it is awesome. Definitely give it a try. It's a big one. It can get to be probably 12 to 15 feet tall. Um, usually a multi-stem that you can have, but really nice for the corner of a landscape. And again, when it's in bloom in July, spectacular. Just absolutely awesome. So a couple perennials and then I'll end up with bulbs and then take any questions at the end. So here's our friend Carl Forrester. We have met him before. Uh, spirea is one that if you're looking to attract pollinators, this would be a great one for your landscape. So I call it a sub shrub slash perennial because it's kind of weird. Um, essentially what you would do every spring is you would whack it back by at least half, if not two thirds. So you would basically clear cut this down to the ground and then it's going to form all of this new growth 
and the flowers um, on the growth that it formed that year. So it's generally in forms of purple. Um, you can have a darker purple, a lighter purple, but in terms when this is blooming, oh my gosh, the bees, the pollinators, it is absolutely incredible. It is just buzzing. It is amazing. Um, if you've run into issues with Russian sage and found that it maybe escaped the area a little bit too much, Bloomis spirea um, is a really good choice. And I forgot to put the scientific name, but it's Caryopteris. Uh, that's the scientific name, but Bloomis spirea, again, maintenance is super easy, very drought tolerant. In the spring, just whack it back by half or two thirds and you don't have to be pretty about it literally just whack it back, take your pruners and clear cut it um, by a lot and then watch it grow. It's really, really a nice plant. Uh, the leaves are a little bit silvery, kind of a silvery green color, but pollinator friendly uh, to a tea. It's amazing. I threw a false indigo in here because I have a lot of respect for this perennial um, as it starts to mature. Um, I do have one that again gets zero water and is constantly being run over by a beagle that happens to live in my household. So uh, I give this one really top notch for being a tough plant. Uh, false indigo, there's a few different cultivars that have been introduced. There's also the just the regular species, kind of the native species that has um, that's available. But you can get it in purple, yellow. Um, and in terms of maintenance, another one that might get to be, it's at least hip high at the end of the growing season. So probably at least four feet by four feet. Um, the seed heads persist and they actually kind of rattle as they dry down, which is really nice. Um, so that's something that you can consider. And then the flowers are just spectacular. So um, sparkling sapphires was introduced because it has kind of a darker purple color, but then lemon meringue, love the name, love the color, uh, that would be a good one too. So false indigo would be a nice one that you could kind of pair in front of a, a taller shrub behind it, but then kind of like pair that to have kind of a stair step effect, but really good plant. Ornamental grasses, they're amazing. I think every garden should try to incorporate them in some way, shape or form. Um, there are some that have great fall color. So Shenandoah is a switchgrass. Uh, gets to be about five feet tall. Heavy metal is their kind of partners together. Um, heavy metal and Shenandoah, four to five feet tall. The flowers are like fireworks above the plant. Really, really ornamental and persist long into the fall and into the winter. Little blue stem is a native. Um, Blaze is an introduced cultivar of little blue stem and blaze was introduced obviously because it has this really nice red fall color and it matches perfectly with the orange cat. So the University of Minnesota has done a lot of research on ornamental grasses. So blaze is one of their introductions and they have a number of others. Blonde ambition is one that was introduced by plant select. Uh, blue grandma grass is another native. So if you go east, towards Kansas, towards Wyoming, uh, not Wyoming, um, yeah, well, Wyoming, Nebraska, uh, you will actually run into our native blue grandma and then Blonde Ambition was introduced because it has a little bit different seed head, a little bit more yellow, um, but the seed heads persist as well. Both Little Blue Stem and bl Blue Grandma are only about three feet tall. Um, heavy metal, the switch grasses get to be about four to five feet tall. Maiden grass, um, if you want a maiden grass, they can be five to six to seven feet tall. And then if you want a really big one, you could do the pampas grass, but I think the pampas grass for the most part, they can be invasive and they're probably too big for most landscapes. So select your grasses accordingly, um, leave them tall and standing during the winter months and then cut them back in the spring. And just a couple bulbs, because I think like as we start to landscape our front and we're using our front doors, walking out to get the mail or having guests over, having some sort of life and color in the garden is really important, even if it's just a cute little crocus that pops up. Um, so a couple of things you can consider, alliums are incredible. And alliums come in all shapes and forms, all heights. You can get huge alliums that are 
you know, where the, the flower itself could be eight to 10 inches tall and then a really nice stalk. You could get little tiny cute alliums, ping pong. Um, I have some ping pong and they're maybe two feet tall and they kind of waft in the breeze. They're cute, I really like them. Um, but you can see lots of different colors, lots of different variations. Um, they're in the onion family and they are very drought tolerant. Once established, they do not need water whatsoever. And the nice thing is, the seed heads kind of dry naturally on the plant and so you could leave them in place after they flower and they'll add some character to your summer garden as well. The species tulips, these are different than the Dutch tulips. Uh, species tulips, some of them, um, they were introduced because they tend to be more drought tolerant. Um, you can tell they have a different texture and look to them. The leaves are a little bit more strappy um, but they are all over Denver Botanic. So if you head down to Denver Botanic in the spring, you will see tons of species tulips, but also they have really beautiful coloring in there. So that magenta with kind of the lavender throat, absolutely beautiful. Um, you can get some orange tulips, but again, you could add these to your walkway or just to your front landscape, or um, maybe you have a place where the sidewalk in front of your house meets. Uh, your own landscape. You could put some there just to have some enjoyment for the passersby. Um, but spring bulbs are really nice. These would all be planted in the fall um, with blooming in the spring. And with that, I will wrap up. I will take any questions and then you can do uh, your meeting and I'll keep the Zoom running so you can do any business that you have. But thank you for joining me. If you need to email me, I'll also put this in the chat um, and I will send the slides and the recording and then some um, information to Kim that then she can share with the rest of the club. Allison, I have a question for you. This is Kim. Hi, Kim. Um, I do have two of the Hot Wings maples, the multi-stem maples, and they are really pretty when those red Samaras um, change into that bright color. The only thing about it is, is that those dry and blow all over my yard and into my neighbor's yards, unfortunately. Um, I don't think I'm making friends with that because then it starts <laughs> seedlings in their yard. Is there anything that I can do so I can curtail the form formation of those? No, unfortunately, that's just the nature of the plant. And so um, anytime something sets seed, oh, it wants to grow. Um, and sometimes they're sterile, but a lot of times those seeds are viable. Um, so recommendations for you and your neighbors is just get those seedlings when they're little, pull them, um, even scuff them with your toe. Um, anything you can do, their roots are not strong enough to really take hold. So um, do what you can, but that, yeah, that's unfortunately something that we see with some of the maples. Okay, thanks. Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, I had two terms I heard you use. You talked about a dingo and I don't know what that is. Oh yeah. So a dingo is just like a small uh, machine. It's, a, it's a kind of a small like backhoe. Um, it's, I think it's a, like the common or the, the actual brand name but it's basically like a little backhoe and you can put different attachments on them. Um, oh. and that's what people can use to scrape it away. They might have like a little like bulldozer scoop on there. Um, but it's used a lot in landscaping because it's small and fits into yards. Okay, and you had you used a person's name, Gertrude Blank, right plant, right place, and I couldn't hear the last name. Yes, Gertrude Jekyll. So it's J E K Y L L. Yeah. Really? Yes. Okay, thank she you. Those are my famous, questions. Yeah, she was a famous English designer. Um, she she's cool. You should read about her. Okay. Hi, Allison. Hi. Uh, this is Gordon Holiday. Um, I have a question about a house plant. I have a peace lily that's taken over my office. <laughs> and I want to know if I can split it or if I can tr transplant it or what. It's, it's, it's in a big enough pot, but it's, it's about uh, four feet tall. Wow. And it needs to be, I need to do something with it. It's starting to look like it's crying out for help. <laughs> um, yes, Gordon, you can divide it. So 
Um, in the spring, I would wait a couple months until things get a little bit warmer. Then you're going to lift the entire plant out of the pot and find a tool, a shovel, a knife, uh, where you can then chunk it up into sections. So if it's that big, you could probably get at least four divisions. Um, keep one for yourself and put it in a pot, knowing that you're going to stress it out and then give the rest of the pieces to your friends at the Loveland Garden Club. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, okay, I'll, I'll donate it to the club. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, it's about to my take style. over my office. <laughs> That's pretty Thank awesome. You. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>